When I die of rabies, I want to be buried with the wave runner card. The wave runner. <laughs> Is it because of the foam on the waves? Yeah, it's the foam on the waves. This holds true to the whole thing. Uh... So hey everyone, we got another episode of Muddled Dice. This is Dan. We got Gary here tonight. We've got a hey. pretty cool guest with us tonight. We got Brandon Wallens, the creator of the new card game War Company. Just had a pretty successful Kickstarter. Uh, Hello. <laughs> do you want to give like an elevator pitch for the game, Brandon? All right. So Warco is an expandable card game, which is like a non-fantasy flight way of saying living card game it's in the same family as magic or netrunner okay and it's a game about war scarcity and making hard choices the objective is to run your opponent out of cards survive longer than anyone else cool cool sounds good we actually uh gary and i actually played a couple rounds today earlier today and i enjoyed it i like the kind of simplicity it's like a simpler version of like magic or you know or netrunner well, I'm glad to hear that. It's always exciting when somebody says that they uh, tried it for the first time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, let's just, I got like a list of questions, so we can just start from the top. Um, so other than an indie game designer, what do you what do? you do? So during the day, <laughs> when I'm not moonlining as a card game designer, <laughs> I'm working in a hospital on oh. their IT system. Oh, cool. So do you do mm-hmm. like uh, like billing coding or just like networking kind of stuff? I work in the HR building actually, working on an application website right now. Oh, okay, cool. So have you been um, have you been kind of like a lifelong hardcore gamer, like video games or board games, or is this just kind of something that like more recently sparked your interest? I've been into gaming just as a general concept for a really really long time, but in modern board games, I got bit with the bug. Jeez, really recently, actually. I, I was designing before I got super, super, super into board games, too. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was the, if you remember, what was the game that got you into board games? The first one that made me really realize that, you know, modern board games were different than Monopoly and Connect Four and all that um, was Pandemic. Nice. That's the first one I got really into. <laughs> that's yeah, pretty that's, cool. That's a good one. That's I think that's a good, um, I think that's a stepping stone for a lot of people. For me, it was uh, it was Settlers of Catan, but I know a lot of people who've gotten into board gaming through through pandemic. I think I was I, I think I wasn't really around when Scatan got <laughs> when Scatan got as popular as it did. Can I call it Scatan? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I was in college actually. I played it for a uh, for a, a class on game design, so that's how I got into it. But um. And Gary, feel free to jump in. You don't have to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I didn't have any significant contribution for that one. Is uh, I didn't. I got into gaming just because you said you needed an artist for it, <laughs> and then it's like, <laughs> okay, I'll try all of these yeah. games then. <laughs> <laughs> well, the amazing thing is, you never think of board games as being as big as they are, and then all of yeah. a sudden, you realize it's a huge community. It's kind of it, yep. it's a mind blowing thing when you realize it. It, it was, yeah. Like when I started, I thought I thought board games were you know Scrabble and Monopoly, and I had no idea right. the the variants and the, all the different kinds of games out there. I think Catan was actually the first one to really uh, popularize the modern kind of board game. I mean, unless I you're, you're willing right, yeah. to count Risk. Yeah, yeah. Um. Okay, so what? Uh, so you said like you've kind of been designing War Machines since you were like. In middle school, right? Yeah, or, that's right. Uh, company, sorry. Uh, I started working like an early, early version of it when I was eleven. But I mean, like this is very, very. <laughs> this is only slightly related to what it is now, right? Right. Like, um, actually, I was just really into Yu-Gi-Oh, like the TV show, not even the card game. I didn't even understand how to play the card game, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know if anybody does. <laughs> um, and I was just watching this show and I made my own game up after that. Cause, um, well, I just wanted something to play with the neighborhood kids and a lot of parents for whatever reason wouldn't let their kids play Yu-Gi-Oh. So I was like, well, I'll just make my own game. Right. And I used the TV show as a reference and it ended up about as you'd expect. So, 
Nice. So what what made you? I mean, I imagine you had the, you probably had the game and then decided to like make it into a sellable product, or was it the other way around? A little bit of both. Okay. I had old versions of the very first cards that I made, like cut up on printer paper with just whatever ballpoint pen I could find. Mm. Like I had copies of that around, but I reworked it at five years after, and then a few years after that, and then finally I just. I just, I was looking for something to create. I was looking for a business to start. And I, and I thought to myself, like, why did I never finish that game? I started a long, long, long time ago. Cool. Yeah, when you already put all the work in. Well, not all the work. I actually had to rewrite it from scratch. I mean, like, it was up to about version oh, five when I yeah. picked it up. And the version that got sent to Print Ninja and printed was 17. <laughs> just to, have, just to get an idea how like yeah that's game development for you yeah yeah do you still have the first version that you started out with in middle school i have re i have some of it like i have, I don't even know if i have enough to play <laughs> that's pretty cool because like i'm i'm the kind of i'm a little bit sentimental when it comes to that kind of stuff and i try to keep everything together in like a notebook but when it's loose pieces like that like you're lucky if you have uh uh, fragments in a folder or something. I so wish ask. I wish I had a system of record for doing that because I just made the cards up from scratch and sometimes they'd have the same name and the stats wouldn't even match. Because <laughs> um, I, I was 11, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, man, sometimes I wish I had that because then I could play it as it was back then. I didn't start record keeping until the second version, which I was like 16. I did that. That's when it got a sci-fi skin to it because it wasn't originally sci-fi. It was something different. It's kind of hard to explain. Um, well, actually, I was just going to ask you what it was, but you said it's hard to explain. Well, you said you kind of like based it off the sh off Yu-Gi-Oh, so it was kind of like magic. <laughs> no, very <laughs> like it was called dodgeball cards, and it had nothing to do with dodgeball because, of course, not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the basic idea is that the the attacking cards were um, just cannons and cannonballs, different okay. types there. And you had utilities, which were like traps and spells, basically. Okay. Or now in modern warfare, I'd, I'd call them technologies. Oh, okay. Cool. So actually, some mechanics did stay. Not very many, but a handful did survive from that initial version. Like the total number of cards you can play, some of the drawing rules, mm -hmm. a handful of card names... Um, just a general pattern of attack, but like most of the rest is was created over successive versions and a lot of testing. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, so the one of the things that caught my attention when you had when you were doing the Kickstarter and even before was the extensive lore of your game, and it it made me think of other games like Magic: The Gathering that have all of this. Like, I mean, I think Magic's got like books about, you know, like whole books behind different cards and stuff so what what kind of thing inspired the lore for your game like what, i'm gonna tell on my books or whatever was that i'm gonna tell on myself a little bit here and okay. say that i didn't actually have much of a reference when i was doing that like i didn't know of any other games that were doing that mm -hmm. i just saw on the bottom of cards in the very few card games that i knew about of this type at the time i saw like on the bottom of magic cards and Yu-Gi-Oh cards and pokemon cards they'd have little sentence stories and i thought well why doesn't somebody just make a page article a web page for each one of these and give them long stories and link them back and forth like wikipedia oh. so i did that so for every card this was like early 2015 i started doing this i just wrote a different article for every single card and linked them together but I didn't have a direct influence on that. The writing itself did have more influence, but I didn't have a game specifically nudge me into that. Okay. I and accidentally you... came up with someone's idea, someone else's idea <laughs> on my own. Well, I can That's imagine. The best way to generate it. Yeah. Right. Um, well, any like like movies or books that inspired you in the lore, or just kind of like general sci-fi stuff? I actually wrote out wrote down a bunch of stuff. Um, just because this is not the because just trying to list this off the top of my head mm. like oh goodness um it comes from 
a variety of places like personal experiences and offices and just the way that I've observed <laughs> people talking and just like the weird feelings of disillusionment and frustration you can get in a place like that right. to literature like as high as like as as academic sounding as Kafka and Huxley and Orwell and, like stuff you read in like English class to like creepy pasta doomsday prepper websites awesome. SCP Foundation, if you've ever heard of that, yep. I don't know. TV Tropes. <laughs> so, like, I just had a whole bunch of different influences on that. Oh, that's cool, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse mm-hmm. me. Um, yeah, I could see that kind of reading the... I can see that in the in the, the, the tweets you send out a lot, that kind of... Kafka, oh, the tweets like, are their own thing. Corporate kind of thing. The tweets are their whole separate thing. Like, none of that is canon. I, I don't know if anybody's <laughs> keeping up with canon, but, like, nothing I say on Twitter is canon. <laughs> That's, like, I just play it. I go way dramatic on that because Twitter's not a place for nuance. Right, yeah. yeah. No, it's it's great. I like it. It's, it makes me laugh, although, like, that's funny, but it could be true. <laughs> <laughs> I could see a company doing that. My plan is just tweet my way into becoming a politician. That's the idea. <laughs> I think it's going to work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, uh, let's see. You can talk about the lore. So you, you, you write all the lore then? Yes. I've written all of the lore with the sole exception of one article, which is Essence of Time, written by my friend Alex. Okay. Cool. So, yeah, all the lore pretty much. Um, I know... Before we move on to this next question, I know, Gary, you had a question you wanted to ask about the art, I think. You want to get into that a bit? I'm trying to remember what my question was. I uh, I was wondering, how how did you meet James, and how did you uh, bring him in on this project? Because in, the, in the, the games that Dan and I have worked on, it was kind of like, like, I know Gary, I know that he does uh, digital illustration work or whatever. It's like, hey, do you want to try a hand at this? So I was curious to know how you met him because, I mean, he has really good artwork. So I, it, in my opinion, it would be rare to just stumble upon a friend that would be like, <laughs> hey, you're that good. Let's go ahead and do this. Well, after about 60 hours of perusing DeviantArt and sending out message. No, actually, I did actually stumble <laughs> across him. I got this was sheer blind luck. I could not have possibly been luckier. That same friend, Alex, I mentioned like a minute ago. Mm. Um. Oh, God, this is going to sound like a mess, but I know Alex through Minecraft because I got super into that game five years ago, six years ago, something like that. Alex knows new James from where they played Club Penguin as kids. So he introduced me to James. A guy I know from Minecraft knew a guy from Club Penguin. That's how I found James. And I sent him I sent him some art, and I'm like, do some samples of this. Let's see what you can do. And he sends back just this incredible looking spaceship and I say you're you know, you're hired. Right. That's crazy. Nice. Yeah, it was ridiculous. I got yeah, I got blind lucky. Like I could tell you how to find good artists now, but that was a stroke of luck. Yeah, I and I saw saw your links to DeviantArt. So when you started down that path, I was like, Oh, okay, well that's totally believable. (laughs) Mm -hmm. No, I actually, I do peruse a lot of DeviantArt. Everything I share is within the Creative Commons. And any of those people, I don't know if anybody ever reaches out to them, but if you're looking for an artist, those are really good names to start with. Like, you just go down my Instagram, anybody's name that you see in a citation, send them a message. I'm sure they'd love to get paid work like that. (laughs) Cool. Good advice for any other indie devs listening. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right. So we've talked about the game and about kind of how it started. So we've talked about how it started. So, uh, so then what's next? What's next for for War Company for Pangea Games for Brandon? Let's see. I gotta think about that. <laughs> sure. All right. So at the time that we're recording this, um, it's January seventeenth, mm-hmm. and this is important because time is a big factor. Um. So by the time this is published, the campaign's probably going to be completely concluded. Everybody will have received their rewards. But still, step one for me, as of this moment, this evening on January 17th, is get those last few rewards fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Uh, And pay my third-party distributors. Um, (laughs) and, And then, like, 
post my final thoughts on what I did right and what I did wrong and just bring the Kickstarter to a nice conclusion, have that, have that closure, you know, that a lot of people seek that a lot of campaigners don't provide, give in just lots of thanks to the backers and supporters. So, you know, but first things first is type all those loose ends. Cool. Now, the second thing I just announced this today, I'm going to start selling it and selling Warco publicly um on valentine's day cool (laughs) so this is on amazon or on my website too but i'm taking pre-orders until then i'm hoping to sell the rest of the print run maybe order a second one um maybe work with retail or a subscription box afterward i don't know i'm still figuring a lot of this stuff out but in the meantime i'd also like to make another game one about road trips i don't know what about road trips but one definitely (laughs) about road trips Nice. That sounds like it'd be open for a lot of creativity. I like the idea of that. I I go on a lot of long road trips, so that is just fertile ground, and I could find an artist to do you know awe inspiring stuff just based on like pictures I've taken on my phone and things you can find on the internet. Somebody's got to make a game about that. There's so much, there's so much story in the places that you drive by on the highway and never pay yeah. attention to. Yep. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah, and I like um, I like that you said you just have kind of, you just have like an idea, not even an idea for a game, but for a theme. Like, <clears throat> excuse me, for me that's like how a lot of my games start. Like I, or or like even Gary's, you know, we just come up with like a two word phrase or like let's make a game about whatever and figure out the mechanics later. Yeah, like so, what kind of what kind of fruit is that uh, born so far? How how's that turned out? Uh, for us, we got a couple games mm-hmm. we're working on. Neither of them have been as successful as yours quite yet. I'll say yet. <laughs> um, hey, time, man, time. Yeah. But, no, I mean, like, I'm, you know, the the Dangerous Sea account I contacted you through, that was originally set up for our board Viking-themed board game, where I was just kind of like, hey, there should be a game about Vikings traveling to different islands. And so we figured it out. And then we've got some other stuff coming up that, we haven't announced yet, but we probably will by the time this comes out. Gary had an idea for a game about hostas, you know, that like that weedy plant that grows in gardens. So we're like, yeah, all right, let's do it. <laughs> we figured out the mechanics later and did it. Just combine the two Vikings and hostas yeah. in the same one. <laughs> uh, that'd be great. Most yeah. of the ideas come together like that. It's like, we'll we'll go to a convention or something like that. And we drive him back and be like, you know what? We should have yeah. this and have that as like a demo piece just to show other people what we've done. Not, a, not necessarily put it up for sale, but um, things just kind of like uh, building a portfolio of games. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Because it's like those little ideas you can, if they don't take off on their own, you can always recycle them into bigger and better things. Like you see that with a lot of um, successful TV show runners too. Like you'll see their old sketches. They'll just borrow jokes from that and they'll put it into something else. Oh yeah. yeah. And it's always practice for game design. I mean, there's never, right. You're never going to get worse at it by doing it more. Excuse me. No, I wouldn't think so. Right. I mean, it's someone might, I guess, but... Yeah, I'm approaching the peak. It's all downhill. Uh, all right, let, let's talk about Kickstarter a little bit. Um, so, like, I was watching it, and it seemed to be... It seemed to go good. I mean, you got fully funded. You know, people were excited about it. Uh, did it, Was that your experience on your side of it? Did it seem to go good, too? Or was there... Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a complex beast. <laughs> oh, my friend, that is a complex beast. The first one I did, just uh, you know, full disclosure, like it bombed. I did one in February, and I don't know if you caught that link in the middle of the page, but I just point out, I'm like, guys, I've done a Kickstarter before. It didn't make it very far. That was actually my first experience with that. Mm-hmm. Was raising like sixteen hundred on a seven thousand dollar goal. Yeah. Um, now. When it came to that, that was extraordinarily painful in ways that's hard to describe. And it it really changed the way I saw um, game development and business and creativity. I wrote down a lot of stuff I did wrong. I've got full Evernote lists of like 40 things I did wrong. Like it's just called 40 things I did wrong. (laughs) Um, And then like I took that and I made – I just did as much as I could to get – everything i could think of wrong right in those six months then i went into the second kickstarter and it 
it went well. Mm-hmm. By every measurable metric, it went well. But the whole time it was going on, everything to me was so hectic and crazy that I didn't actually internalize that I had done it until October. Like, the <laughs> at the very end of October. This campaign ended in the middle of September. Right. So, like... It, it, everything went well, right? I raised 12510 on a $10,000 goal. Um, it, it's going to fulfill on time because those last few packages are in the air and trucks in Europe right now. And that's awesome. it. It's within the budget. And I actually beat that budget by about just enough to where I didn't have to put any more of my own money in. Like, I still had to put money in to get the art, but, like, I didn't have to put any extra in on the print run, and I had budgeted, like, 2500 to do that. So, yeah. like, and it's getting good feedback on Board Game Geek, too. Yeah. And, like, and but the paradox is that, like, even with all these good things telling me it's, it's going well, the campaign's going well, it's still a roller coaster. The whole thing is just, uh, it's hard to process at once. I can imagine, yeah, yeah. It's really fun, though. It's really fun. Do you have the international ones uh, printed overseas, or did you have those printed here and then shipped off? I actually have a whole update um, just describing the complex series of events that led from them getting from one place to another. But the short version is they went from China, they uh, they went on an ocean liner to L.A., they flew them out to Knoxville, they drove them down to Chattanooga, wow. I picked them up myself, Um fulfilled the American ones, kept everything else, and then sent some off to Canada and some off to Europe. And did they go to distribution centers there to... Yes. Okay. Now, you can't actually send them straight from manufacturer to third-party distributor, which is anybody who's thinking about a Kickstarter, that's a good idea. Mm. But it it wasn't really appropriate for what I was doing because I had relatively few international backers for this one. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it was like 25 or 30. So I did the, like, I just received all the inventory myself rather than getting someone to commission it for me in China. It would have been a mess. Right. It would have yeah. been a mess to organize. Yeah, when you yeah. captured. Oh, go ahead, Dan. <clears throat> oh, no, I was going to say, I saw, um, I think, in one of your updates that you, you, like, basically turned your little apartment into a shipping center for a couple weeks. <laughs> <to fill all laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, that, that you want to know. Cool. You know, the, even. Like, right after I fulfilled that, like, literally the day after um, those were those were sent to the U.S. Post Office, I moved into a house. Like, I literally closed on a house the day after fulfilling that, too. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I actually <laughs> ended up moving them. It was, it's about 800 pounds of stock. I had to move 600 into the new house. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Hopefully you didn't pick the third floor. <laughs> Oh no! Thank goodness I was on the second floor, which because of the because of the just the bizarre way this city is laid out with all the hills is actually the ground floor. Oh, okay, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Seen places like that, yeah. Uh, Gary, you had a, so you were going to say something before I interrupted. I, yeah, the question you didn't interrupt. I just we just started at the same time. Wow. The, the when you captured the 40 things that you did wrong did you just do research on that or did you reach out to say like a mentor or uh business professionals or, or whatever the topic may have been on the thing that you did wrong did you spend was it you or did you did you try to find someone who could answer the questions the first thing I did was just write down everything I knew in my head and in my gut was wrong I just got that all out of my head I started looking at blogs to inform myself, like Jamie Stegmeyer's blog is a big deal. Started reading a lot. I wrote down some there. Um, I started asking a lot of people on Twitter because I had that and Instagram going for me at the time. A lot of, I had a lot, I had been making relationships with reviewers and with podcasters and bloggers in that time. And slowly I began to realize more of the things I did wrong that I that just like nobody could have known um, in the position I was in. Yeah. You just, you just have to talk to a lot of people. You have to clear out your own head, read as much as you can and talk to a lot of people. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, What was that, that blog you said you were reading? 
Um, Jamie Stegmeyer's Kickstarter lessons. Jamie Stegmeyer? Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, check that out and put it in the description of the video. If there is, like, one blog you have to read before you do a board game Kickstarter, that one's the one. Good did you have, <laughs> It's a uh, huge does, deal. Does he mention, or did you think to create an email list prior to the Kickstarter so you could kind of advertise to anybody who had shown interest, maybe, say, through visiting a web page first? Kind of like sadly, the free gift that they do. Sadly, I was not savvy enough to actually, like, leverage my email list at that point, <laughs> which was probably a reason I didn't make as much money. But, uh, no, I had, like, 20 people on my email list. One of them yeah. was me, one was my brother, and one was my mom, so that tells you the situation. <laughs> I got most of my emails from the Kickstarter, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. So did you, um... Okay, yeah, so here's a question I didn't think of before. Did you see uh, your 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 audience, did you see most of them come in before the Kickstarter, or was it more, you got more people after it was announced and there was something for them to, to buy? You know, I know there's data on this somewhere, <laughs> but, and I know it's on the campaign, but I don't even want to try and fool with pulling up that dashboard. I want right. to say it was about 65-35. I brought okay. as much of my own crowd as possible, and mm. Kickstarter provide about thirty-five percent. Okay. Well, yeah, that kind of that seems to jive with most of the advice I've read. You want, you know, right. want a bigger crowd before you start the Kickstarter. The, right. You want to build a community long before then, and yeah. a community is not about having lots of followers. It's about having a lot of people you can talk to. Mm. That's the that's the main thing that sets up Kickstarters for success, and that. Or in just business in general. That's a factor of just time and intentionality. Yeah. Yeah, like networking instead of, mm -hmm. say, Facebook likes. Which yeah. a ton of Twitter followers and Instagram followers, like, that did me favors, sure. But the one that, but the thing I did that really pushed it over the edge and is responsible for the success of the cam campaign directly was Twitch streaming. Really? Yeah, I, you know... I've had lots of happy little accidents happen to me, but like, because I've, because I've been so active on Twitter, I've followed a lot of people in a lot of walks of life. And one was a Twitch streamer who said, why don't we stream a version of your game? Like right after I had a digital version. So I started doing that. Uh, and after the first game, her community just adopted me ever since. <laughs> and, and then that launched more streams and more streams. And suddenly I realized I'm like, Twitch is just a new form of radio. Yeah. This is an intimate form of communicating with people. This is not shouting out into the distance like Twitter. This is getting people's attention in the same way that like um, NPR would get somebody's attention on a long drive or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Definitely. I like that. It's a much more intimate way of communicating, believe it or not. And people don't take Twitch stream all that serious. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's so silly. So you had a... Um... I think I remember this from back in the day. You had a uh, a tabletop simulator version, right? And I still do. Testing? Oh, it's still out there? Oh, yeah. You can play it for free. Oh, cool. Um, okay, so, well, so this kind of leads into my next questions then. Uh, I know a while ago you talked about starting a game dev blog, kind of. That's right. So what's, um, w what's that all about? I mean, obviously, other than game development. <laughs> Well, I started this, I want to say late October, and mm. the blog is called Brandon the Game Dev, because I was getting creative with titles, I suppose. <laughs> and the basic idea is, I feel like when I did my Kickstarter, nobody had given me in one place the kind of thing I would have wanted to read when I was kickstarting, I had to find it from a bunch of different other places. Mm -hmm. So I, so I decided to make this site that I wish existed. I decided to make a site whose purpose is to make game developers sit down and think deeply about the hobby that they're serving. That's a, that's a lofty goal. Oh, cool. Um, how, how's it uh, been going? I mean, I haven't really had a chance to check it out much, but it's been, it's been taken off. Um, surprisingly well it's it gets a handful of visitors every day which is really good i think for a site that's been up only a couple of months yeah i'm mostly 
I like it's been less of a priority than Warco, but I still do two posts every week, and I got an, its own Twitter account, which I think is the one you might have found me through. Uh, could be. I follow, I follow both your Twitter accounts for the. Yeah, it gets confusing after a while. Yeah. Imagine, <laughs> imagine when you're in my case and you're switching back and forth between them. Oh, I bet. I yeah. have I have literally had conversations with myself on accident there. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That sounds um, like the issue that we have with uh with with dangerous games and dangerous sea. It's it's yeah. uh, you know how Facebook is with not recognizing who you are. It just knows that you have access to your page. So right. So so and so gives it a like or whatever. It's like I didn't like that yet. It's like where did that come from? <laughs> basically, yeah. basically. Yeah. So the the site is pretty much split into four sections, mm-hmm. and that's motivation, know how, philosophy, and game breakdowns. The last one being, I take a specific example and I explain one characteristic about it that I think is worth it, like paying attention to. Okay, so you do Which, kind of like a deep analysis of a of a game mechanic or something. Kind of, but one with a a really limited scope. Like, I want to say why one game is really good at one particular thing. Why Pandemic brings people together. Why Twilight Struggle is just so incredibly tense the whole time. (laughs) Um, Why Monopoly gets picked on. (laughs) Actually, I did that. I got one coming up, um, which will probably be posted by the time this is edited. It's like, I just broke from board games for a second. I'm doing an analysis of Town of Salem, oh, which nice. is uh, the online game that I got really into, like, one of my semesters in college. And I'm like, how simple rules turn into a complex game of social deduction? Stuff oh, like that. Cool. Very cool. Um, all right, well, that, th- those are all the questions I had. Um, Gary, do you have anything else you wanted to, you wanted to bring up? Uh, I don't off the top of my head. Um, most of mine, uh, obviously my stuff is going to be either art based or it's going to be based, uh, on what could be done from a business aspect because if I, I, I spend a lot of time, uh, each week trying to figure out the different angles, uh, what's missing, I guess, in business. So that's something that really interests me and, and you've already covered that or to a degree, Plus the um, when we were talking about the shipping and distribution, that's something that I need to look into further. I don't know right. too much about that. Like I've uh, in personally, I've got a couple of products that I've developed on my own. And it's like, well, where do I take that now to um, to either get things like trademarked, copyrighted, and all that stuff, and then go further with publishing and figuring out how it's going to get out to people. As far as the the web goes um building lists and being able to market and sell to people i've got that covered but there's just a few unknowns and and so it intrigues me when it comes to a project like this the different um activities that need to go into um getting a completed product and getting it out into people's hands right and if you would like i can even um run over a few things when we're not recording too so we can do that okay but if you That's have specific awesome. questions you'd like for me to answer on the podcast, I can do that as well. Yeah, I guess that was a little bit long-winded <laughs> and all-encompassing. Um, no, I don't, it, I don't have any. complex subject. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of people – I remember when Kickstarter first started off, people were just like, yeah, you like submit your idea. You don't even have to have a product done, and like people throw money at you. And so everyone like, rushed it. <laughs> That's how people think business works. In reality, yeah. it's like three to five years of blood and sweat and not knowing yeah. if you're going to make it. Yeah, and everybody thinks that you're just an overnight that. success. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Kickstarter is definitely that. It is just one small barrier to entry removed. That is yeah. what Kickstarter does. It is a miracle not because it made everything easy, but because it took one small obstacle out of like a hundred out of the way. There were so many people. I remember in the beginning, like people that I funded, some people were already established. So they had their stuff together and you funded them. They knew exactly what to do and they delivered. And then there's other people that I funded back in 2013. I still haven't received the product from them. Not, (laughs) Not say anything bad about them, but it's, it's just that that's the reality of it. They thought like, well, I can do this. And so they tried and it was, 
I mean, they're really getting a life experience right there. They, I'm sure that they won't run into that ever again, but yeah. they, they will emerge as the business person that they thought they were in 2013. <laughs> if I had to say if i had to call out one thing that causes that kind of problem to happen it's just like you cannot go into kickstarter with magical thinking if you are it's kind of hard to explain exactly what i mean by magical thinking but everything you think you're going to do you have to think about in a scientific way you have to Mm. examine every single aspect you have to really be careful about the steps that you're making before you go to kickstarter Kickstarter is like Kickstarter is not square one. It's like square 50. <laughs> yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of thinking about it. It's like, well, what's it going to cost to do this and how many, um, how many freebies can we throw in with this tier? And yeah. like how many is too many tiers and how many is too few? Like we want people to have options, but they shouldn't have infinite options. So I'm a fan of like seven personally. Yeah. yeah. Seven or eight. Yeah, you want a, yeah. a good number of options, but you don't want to be overwhelmed by yeah. choice or complex choices. And that's one of the weird little things about the way our minds work is actually more choice does not necessarily make a person happier with their choice. Yeah, You want to grant people autonomy, but if you make a person make a decision out of hundreds with little information, you're taking more autonomy than you're granting. Talk it's a weird that. thing to think about. There was yeah, a, I, I went to a dealership and they told me, they're like, well, it's not much more if you want to build your own car. And I was like, you don't <laughs> want me to do that. I was like, it would take me three days to like pick all my options. Mm-hmm. I was like, give me the three that you have on the lot and I'll choose from that. <laughs> I'll take that beat up Toyota Camry in the corner. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a good game design principle too, actually. Mm. unsurprising um all right cool um okay so then last things uh do you have any i was gonna ask you if you had any advice for aspiring game devs or kickstarters but we've kind of covered that quite a bit um okay last question if there was one different one thing you could do different to improve your last kickstarter what would that have been like the thing that you think could have improved it the most if I had to get one specific thing right, one easy thing right, I would have charged less for international shipping. I charge like 30 bucks for the $60 reward for right. international because at the time that's that's what it looked like I needed. Mm-hmm. But man, sometimes sometimes if you find that you need that much money to ship a product, you need to find a way to need less. <laughs> before yeah. asking for more. Yeah. So maybe 20% of my backers were international. That's a pretty low rational ratio compared to like 40% normally. Right. Yeah. But at least you had the, the money there just in case. Cause like, you know, like sometimes you go to ship a, an a odd shaped item. And I know that it, with a card game, you're not going to run into that, but just through the U S postal service, you go to send something that's like one inch off. And it's like, yep, that's going to be $36. Yeah. And it's like uh, it's like so I'm losing ten dollars on the item I just sold. Basically, or you like accidentally misprint postage and you're not allowed to print another one or something, yeah. or you can't quite fit it in that priority box because again, it's yeah. a weird shape. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh goodness, yeah. USPS priority boxes. <laughs> That's a good thing to know about if you were in Kickstarter. Yeah, are they still uh, giving them away for free? They used to be free. They are free. Get the little padded mailers. Those are the good ones. Reinforce them with some cardboard. Yeah. That's the way you do it. (laughs) Nice. I like those little hacks. Yeah, yeah. It's anything you can do to, like, you know, bring costs down a little bit and make the the experience for the customer a little better. Make sure Mm -hmm. stuff gets there without being destroyed. Board gamers love it if you have extra padding around the shipping. <laughs> they absolutely love it. Somebody actually took a picture of my stuff and said, double bubble mailers. <laughs> this guy nice. this guy knows how to ship. And I'm like, God, most other people would just yell that they have to get through two mailers and some bubble yeah. wrap. Yeah. Yeah, board gamers love that. Yeah. It's yeah. quirk of the hobby. 
Yeah, you know, <laughs> trying to keep things. I guess you want to keep things pristine. I think board gaming Mint and collecting uh, crosses paths a lot. So. Yes, they do. Yeah, I know that when I when I go to pick something up at the store, even though I know that it's going to get stored away and, and abused eventually, I always like look through the the different packs that they have. It's like, well, that one has less of like a scuff on the corner, yep. so I'm going to buy that one. <laughs> On the, and it's funny because I'm not that way. I'll grab the banged up can in the grocery store because I know what, no one else will grab that banged up can. I'm like, it's still got the beans in there. What are you guys worried about? Yeah. It's still stack. It's bent on the inside. I bought a, it was like a Nintendo Power overview of uh, uh, NES games. And I was in Barnes and Noble and I like, I picked up the first one. I was like, that one looks like it, someone ran over it. So I, like, I went back <laughs> through the other three that they had on display. I was like, that's the cleanest one. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, that is that is extremely common. It's just little quirks you got to watch out for because that is definitely a customer thing. That's definitely behavior to observe. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's a, that's a good place to wrap it up. Uh, yeah, it's been great having you on, man. Thanks for coming on. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, you got any uh, websites you want to, like, the website for your board game or where you'll be able to buy them or pre-order it, anything like that? Ah, uh, yes, the obligatory plug. Yep. <laughs> okay, so to find Warco's website, you can go to warcothegame.com. That's W-A-R-C-O-T-H-E-G-A-M-E.com, warcothegame.com. And pre-order is a button on there that you can actually see second from the left. Mm -hmm. If you pre-order before Valentine's Day, it's cheaper. So definitely keep an eye out for that. You'll save like $10. It's worth it if you get the full set. Good deal. Oh, I just wanted to the... say, too, I love the relationship ruiner card. Where it... <laughs> the only people... To forever. <laughs> Only people buying the first print run of this game will actually be getting that card, so that's a limited oh, okay. item. Cool. I almost played that against Dan immediately. <laughs> that yeah, I hope nobody actually feelings. uses that card for real play. Because <laughs> that actually that would be a broken card if you took it seriously. It belongs yeah. in Monopoly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's every chance in community chess card. <laughs> Just replace the whole deck. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. Cool. Let's see. The yeah. the game development blog is brandonthegamedev.com. Brandon the Game Dev. Cool. And you can also find Twitter links and all that other stuff on the website too. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'll put all that stuff in the description for the video too. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool, great. So everyone everyone should subscribe to our channel and then go out and buy Warco. It's a pretty fun game. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, yep. thanks again. Thanks for coming on. And thank you, listeners, for listening. Yep. All right. Uh, that's it. I'm going to end this awkwardly like I always do. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> Whew, awkward. <laughs>